The idea of sentient trees is well embedded within the folklore of Europe and particularly the British Isles, where oak, ash and willow trees, amongst others, are in subjects of deep and perennial reverence. Once such great oak tree once stood in a grove in Lumfannon, Aberdeenshire, in North East Scotland, known affectionately as Old Creevy, and was encircled by several smaller trees. Every fifty years on Midsummer's Eve, these trees would leave their hollows to go and drink from a burn, running nearby, and then return to the grove to dance in the solstice, during which Old Creevy will mate with the younger trees in order to perpetuate his lineage on those most auspicious of nights, before quickly returning to their hollows. Several hundred years ago, there was a little old lady who had a very wee lad by the name of Jack. Despite being a loyal and hard-working servant of the Laird of Black Hert, was put away in a tiny grim hovel with little furniture and little furnishings. And once wee Jack was five years old, the Laird demanded the boy make use of himself and set him out alone with the sheep as a keepitch or shepherd to watch over the flocks. For this, Jack was paid but a pittance, but nonetheless he loved the job and was sit under old Creevy on the hillside, a reliable shade in the summer and a shelter in the winter, watching the deer tentatively visit the grove and the salmon leaping in and out of the burn, their scales shimmering in the sun. His mother, the old lady, would come and visit him in the day, both to collect scraps of wool torn off the fleece of the sheep by hedges and branches, and to bring him a plain but hearty meal of bannocks and cheese. She would then take these forage bits of wool to spin and dye into gansies or jumpers. Likewise, earn little, but between them it was honest toil for ends meet. They had each other, and little else truly mattered. One day, at around noon, up she came with a wee basket of homemade sheep's cheese and oatmeal bannocks, which under the shade of old Creevy, they ate together and chatted watching the local wildlife go about their day, when the old lady said, Jack, I had a queer dream last night, that the oak trees here were uprooted and dancing in this grove. But then I remembered that my parents had told me when I was wee, that every fifty years they dance on Midsummer's Eve, and in the hollow beneath them there is much treasure of gold and jewels. Well, Jack, tonight is Midsummer's Eve, and I think they are going to dance. Now, being poor as we are, do we wish to take anything from those hollows? As they dance, we mustn't be greedy. Take a few choice gems and get out quickly. I know we haven't much, but if you take more than we could possibly want for, you will not live to spend it. Here, she said, placing a rope she had knitted with twelve loops into leather satchels beside him. Keep this with you, Jack. Jack listened earnestly to his mum, and she was soon off back to their hovel. As the sun began to set, and the sky all around him from the hill turned a pink and an orange hue, and the birds and the trees rose up in great unison, tweeting and chirping loudly and excitedly. Having spent near his entire life amongst these birds, Jack could understand the birds to some extent, and make sense of their chitterings. He called out to the robin to ask why and where he was off to. Well, Jack, tonight is Midsummer's Eve, and so the oaks shall be dancing. We'll be tossed about in our nests as we sleep, so we are going away for this evening. But we shall be back tomorrow. Bye-bye, replied the robin, matter-of-factly, before flapping away to join his kith and kin, and so all the birds flew off. Suddenly, Jack sensed a presence behind him, and there, looming over his back, was the Laird of Blackheart himself. Now, the Laird, whilst a cruel man, was not a stupid one and knew that Jack was familiar with the birds of the grove. What were those birdies saying to you, my boy? 
Jack turned and hesitantly replied, Well, the birds told me that the trees will be dancing tonight, sir. Mm-hmm. Yes, I've heard of tales of this happening, and that beneath them lies much treasure. I'll be coming back later to get it for myself. And so, off he went back to his castle. Just before it became dark, up the hill came Mary, a servant girl for the laird who lived nearby. Jack was too young for her, but she had great fondness for the wee lad, and she approached, with a black shawl knit by Jack's mother wrapped around her head and shoulders. We Jack, I've come to warn you, she said gravely, wearing a foreboding expression upon her pale and pretty face. The laird at the castle is pacing up and down, and muttering that he is going to come here tonight. Jack, I saw him put a knife in his belt. I think he means to harm you. Jack smiled bravely back at the bonnie lassie, and trying to impress her, sat up straight and said boldly, Don't you worry about me, Mary. I am well able to look after myself. I protect this flock from the wolves and all sorts of beasties, but I will watch for the old laird, so thank you. And so, Mary hurried away to her home, and night fell upon the hillside. The moon came out bright and full, and in the near vicinity an entrancing music began to play, beautiful and lively, like harps and flutes, but not quite. The great oaks began to stir, and slowly edged towards the burn, trailing their roots behind them, leaving old Creevy a wide berth, their lord and chief. Jack watched with amazement, lying prone in the grass, heather and flowers. When the oaks returned onto the hill, they entwined their branches and danced to the lively music like young'uns at a Cayley. Indeed, with many nearby silver birches joining in. Jack was quickly snapped to alertness by a loud crack of a twig, and turning he saw the glint of a dirk and the dark figure of the Laird of Black Hilt standing near him. The Laird brandished the knife's blade at Jack. You lead the birth spot of old Creevy to me, Jack, my lad. Or I'll decorate this grove with your steaming entrails. All that treasure is mine. Jack nodded solemnly, and they both watched a while as the trees danced to the music before the laird decided that he was going to try his luck and dove into the largest of the hollows, wherein a great hoard of treasure was hidden, and he's cackled and howled in pleasant astonishment, filling an enormous sack he had brought with him, with riches fitting of an emperor's hall. But Jack remembered the words of caution issued by his mother, and so selected the smallest hollow from the smallest oak tree, and hopped in it. He chose two fine rubies and a silver trinket, placing them into his wee bag, before realising he had sunk many feet below the surface and was quite a ways down. He frantically began grasping at the sides, trying to get footholds in earth, but it just crumbled away. Jack's heart was in his mouth, and his stomach clenched in terror. Suddenly, a fair, familiar voice rang out from above. Jack, is that you down there? It was Mary's voice. Mary, oh Mary, it's you. How'll I get out? How can I? Jack stopped as he then remembered the rope his mother had brought him. He fished it from his satchel, and with a few attempts, threw it up to Mary for her to hold in place as he climbed his way up. Like a wee mountain goat back up into the grove, to be met with a squeeze from a frightened Mary. Mary! We need to rescue the laird. He's down old Creevy's hole. He'll never make it out, he said urgently. Dragging her by her hand over the deep hole, a pair of them shouted down to the laird that he would hear none of it. Seemingly intoxicated by the treasures he's found, filling his now bulging sack to the brink, whilst laughing manically. Mary and Jack looked about them to see the trees had stopped their dancing and were beginning to lumber their ways back to their hollows. Old Creevy jumped into his hall, not but a moment later, and Jack and Mary heard a sickening crunch as the greedy laird was crushed to death by the descending oak. Jack was able to sell off the treasures he'd pinched that night, and made decent money from them. He bought a little whitewashed thatched cottage at the bottom of the hill for him and his mother, well furnished with all the trimmings. The laird's nephew inherited the land, and he was a far more kindly man and understood well the notion of looking after the land and the folk in his stewardship. He paid Jack a fair wage for his shepherding, and also gave his mother back pay owed to her by the previous laird. When he was a little older, he married Mary, and they lived in the cottage together, raising a family. 
he the shepherd, while she did the odd job in the castle for the young laird. Thank you for tuning in to this folktale from Aberdeenshire, which demonstrates the clear message of living in harmony with the landscape. Jack lived well because he respected not just nature, but the traditions of the land that his ancestors had lived in for generations. He made best of its fruits, but was taught well by his mother not to take more than they needed. The old laird died by literally digging his own grave in obscene wealth. Our land is sacred and special to us. It is not there to be mindlessly exploited in the interests of growth and finance. Take from the land what you need to survive, and we'll look after you well. Know the stories of the woods, glens, streams and clearings near to where you dwell, and maybe you might see something to tell your children and grandchildren. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like and a comment, and if you want to see more content like this, I upload every Sunday at 6pm.